why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling on it. <laughs> the dad joke. Corny, grown worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. <laughs> so take a moment to make your kid laugh because dad jokes rule. Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. And in 1967, a century for Canada and half a century for the NHL, another great leap forward. Hockey's centennial year project, expansion to double the professional league size to 12 teams. It was a big bonanza for the younger players on the threshold, the players' draft. A chance for the new teams to acquire and form a nucleus around the already famous and experienced. Sawchuck, Hall, Bathgate, Bond, Arbor, to inspire and steady all the eager young rookies. And so the world's fastest big league sport, becoming in half a century a multi-million dollar spectacle, goes on to even greater glory and ever greater crowds six new NHL cities and six new teams to ignite the passions of hometown fans. The exploits of Vezina, Morenz, Howe, Hull, and all the others who made and are making hockey the game it is have fashioned the dreams of the kids who will take their places. Someday, someday, when the ankles get stronger, when the skates dig in a little harder, when the legs and wrists get shiftier, when the body checks are on target and the shooting gets sharper, then, brother, the records will be on the line. Then who'll get the cheers and the trophies and the glory? Stand back, Bobby Orr. Look out, Gordy Howe. Watch it, Makita. Move over, Bobby Hull. We're just kids with too many feet, but we're on our way. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available. A curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, watch it, Makita. We're on our way. Yeah, we were on our way. All right, to another episode, another wacky, fun-filled episode, hopefully, of what we like to call Good Seats Still Available. Yeah, how you doing, everybody? My name is Tim Hanlon. As previously announced, I am your doctor of defunct, your captain of contraction, your professor of previously domiciled your reverend of relocation, whatever you'd like to call me, please keep it clean. But uh, indeed, thank you for finding us and downloading us and putting us in your earbuds this week. And we know the challenges uh, of the world out there. It's uh, it's crazy times. Uh, we all uh, trust that you're uh, trying to be as uh, safe uh, and smart uh, and um, conscious as possible about uh, things around you and, and what needs to be done uh, and the various things that uh, you shouldn't be doing either. Uh, and um, hopefully we give you a little bit of, uh, of respite from all of the craziness out there in the world, and uh, we sort of hearken back, I guess, to a more simple time, I don't know, uh, around uh, what used to be in professional sports. Uh, as you can guess by that clip ahead there uh, that we uh, just uh, gave to you, we think is from the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, we're not quite sure, but uh, make no mistake, that was uh, a reference to uh, perhaps the most seminal moment in the history of the NHL, the National Hockey League. That was the great expansion of 1967-68, where six brand new teams uh, came into the scene. Uh, when there were six previously, a doubling of size, uh, many would suggest that uh, the NHL was long overdue by that time uh, to uh, expand and, and move forward and, and sort of uh, you know, expound with the uh, the world, the rest of the world, the United States and Canada, uh, as uh, pro sports was starting to explode all over the place. And uh, that, as well as the before and after of expansion and relocation and all those kinds of things, and the rather, shall we say, haphazard or uh, semi-comical way that the NHL uh, has done it, arguably, over, the, over time, uh, is the uh, subject of our conversation this week, a fun one, with our pal Sean McIndoo. He, uh, to you hockey fans out there, may know. If you don't know, uh, we'll hear a couple of things that you might want to put on your radar. He's the author of the Down Goes Brown. Uh, it's not a website. It's a blog. Yeah, it's a very substantial blog. A, a bit of humor. Actually, a lot of humor. Uh, sort of the uh, head-scratching, uh, curiosity-invoking 
uh, history of uh, of the NHL, both uh, in current form as well as certainly uh, in past form. Obviously, we're going to focus on more of the past kinds of things. But Sean is not only the uh, the author of uh, of that tremendous blog, and I'm sure it's uh, on most people's uh, RSS feeds and, and, and whatnot if you're a hockey fan, but uh, obviously uh, the complimentary uh, Twitter feed at Down Goes Brown. Uh, and of course, uh, in convenient book form, the Down Goes Brown History of the NHL, which is frankly the fodder uh, for our conversation. We get into uh, Sean's uh, unique sort of take, I guess, on the uh, the various uh, checkered uh, and fitful uh, expansionary and relocation oriented history uh, of the National Hockey League. Of course, as we like to obsess on this little show, uh, the NHL just uh, rife with all kinds of uh, of craziness. And, and, you know, it's not as we get into our chat with Sean in a few moments, you know, it's it, the original six. We get into that myth, right? Because uh, there was a, there was, as we've talked about in some previous episodes, Things like the New York Americans or the Brooklyn Americans, as they were also known for a year or two. Uh, there were teams prior to the, shall we say, whitewashing of what the NHL likes to sort of conveniently say is the uh, the the origin of the or the beginnings of this league with the original six. No, there were things like the Montreal Maroons and the Philadelphia Quakers, uh, the original uh, uh, Ottawa Senators, which uh, for a time became the St. Louis Eagles. Uh, the Hamilton Tigers, uh, you know, these are all teams that uh, precede the Detroit Cougars or Falcons. These all precede uh, what is now known as sort of the original six. Uh, but then, then you know, after all that sort of uh, uh, craziness and and solidification and and uh, the sort of during and after uh, World War II kind of, uh, I guess, calming down, if you will, of just uh, keeping sort of six franchises. Although, as you'll hear in our our chat with Sean, you know, there there were some opportunities in the 50s, say, for Cleveland to actually join, uh, which didn't uh, pan out. But the, it, it took all the way until the late 60s for anything to transpire, despite a Western Hockey League, despite a, some very robust and uh, potentially very worthy minor league franchises out there in the world of hockey. Uh, it took all that time until the Big Bang, I guess, if you will, of 1967, 68. And we've we've talked about some of those franchises, some of them uh, you know, still exist today and very strong. Thank you very much. So, so folks like the Philadelphia Flyers and the St. Louis Blues and uh, the conversion of the Vancouver Canucks or the, the Buffalo Sabres. Well, actually, Vancouver and Buffalo came uh, two years after that original. But the California Golden Seals, for example, right? They were one of uh, those uh, those six, the, the Minnesota North Stars, which are now in Dallas. But, uh, you know, the California Golden Seals, of course, uh, you know, didn't last too long. They certainly had different names for sure. Our very first episode uh, is well worth your listen and a few others that we've done. Uh, the Cleveland Barons, which they became for a couple of years. Uh, but frankly, the last team in the NHL uh, to actually fold, uh, that being the Cleveland Barons and them, nay, uh, California Seals or Oakland Seals or California Golden Seals, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but, uh, you know, we get into to all of that. And that's, of course, not sort of the end of the lunacy. Uh, all kinds of stories and, and, and haphazardnesses, if you will. The Quebec Nordiques. Coming over from the WHA, uh, the Hartford Whalers uh, coming over from the WHA, the uh, the Kansas City Scouts, which we've talked about uh, with our pal Troy Treasure, uh, becoming Colorado, and then finally the New Jersey Devils, Atlanta, two times getting a chance at NHL stardom uh, and failing uh, somewhat miserably. Uh, we've gotten to with Dan Bouchard, uh, uh, you know, the Atlanta Flames, and uh, with our pal. J.P. Della Camera being the voice for at least a year or two of the Atlanta Thrashers, now domiciled in Winnipeg and becoming the sort of the second version of the Jets. This is just the, a, a bit of the craziness, the, ha the haphazardness, the arcane and uh, gerrymandered and uh, uh, altogether, though, beautiful, I guess, when you shake it vigorously, a history of the NHL. It's certainly random, it seems, uh, and it's certainly uh, not without uh, quizzical looks and or uh, head scratching at that. And that's what we're going to get into with our conversation this week with Down Goes Brown author, uh, either on the Twitter feed uh, or the book uh, or at, in the, at The Athletic, uh, which is uh, where uh, he uh, gets uh, a lot of his uh, his hockey uh, goodness and coverage out there. If you haven't subscribed to The Athletic, uh, obviously the, today's modern day version, if you will, I guess, of Sports Illustrated and ESPN.com uh, all sort of rolled into one. It's, it's the ultimate sort of uh, sports fans, uh, sports coverage site. It's Sean McAdoo in our conversation this week uh, about the history, the haphazard, the crazy uh, history of the NHL 
and all its various franchise uh, fo- uh, follies. Yeah, you go. that's what I'm looking for. Uh, coming up in just a few moments. We uh, thank you again for listening, and we thank our friends at 503 Sports for being our chosen sponsor of the week. And uh, 503 Sports is uh, the awesome place. It's 503-sports.com for all kinds of great stuff. They are uh, perhaps one of the uh, the better, if not the best, uh, at throwbacks, especially things like handcrafted, uh, custom-made jerseys of, of all kinds of teams uh, of the past. And hockey, in particular, NHL-style hockey, is uh, well represented uh, at 503-sports.com. Make sure you use the promo code SEATS and you're going to get 10% off all of your purchases. So if you're looking for, let's say, I don't know, an authentic 503 jersey uh, featuring that uh, of the original colors and logo schema of the Colorado Rockies uh, or the Hartford Whalers, the Kansas City Scouts, the Cleveland Barons. Yes, the, uh, the a couple of different versions of the Seals, in particular the Oakland Seals, uh, which they were known from 67 to 70. Uh, Atlanta Flames jersey uh, is there. The original 1990s Quebec Nordiques jersey. Uh, all kinds of the Minnesota uh, uh, North Stars, a couple of different versions of those. Uh, all those and many, many more are available for you. You want a hat or you want a T-shirt? Uh, you can get uh, those teams as well uh, there at 503 Sports. Again, it's 503-sports.com. There is an awesome looking uh, blue uh, he calls it Dustin Alameda, our pal at uh, 503 Sports, calls it the reverse Whalers jersey. Uh, it's, yeah, the green and the white, uh, but it's uh, the, the primary color of this jersey, uh, the reverse Whalers jersey, is is a sort of a, uh, it's not quite a navy. It's sort of a lighter navy blue. It's gorgeous. Uh, he call it a 503 remix. And uh, it's a tremendous way to kind of show your pride in this case for being a Hartford Whalers fan from, from days gone by, but maybe kind of, uh, you know, uh, maybe... Uh, shocking people a little bit with sort of an alternate color take, but uh, but still very true uh, to the legacy and the logo of the team. All that stuff uh, is there and much, much more, not just hockey, plenty of other great sports at 503 Sports. Again, that's 503-sports.com. They are the king of throwbacks. And again, of course, remember sure, remember sure? Yeah, of course. Remember, of course, sure, for sure. Uh, it's been a long day. The promo code, it's SEATS. Say it with me, S-E-A-T-S, SEATS. 503-sports.com, 10% off all of your purchases. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, 503 Sports. And thank you, listeners, for uh, continuing to support not only our sponsors, but us on this little wacky journey that we're on. And this week, we're going to get into it. Here we go. Here's our chat with uh, Down Goes Brown author extraordinaire Sean McIndoo. And uh, indeed, we do a conversation about the NHL. It's crazy history. And here it comes. Please enjoy. You know, sort of the zeitgeist of this uh, of this little show, but let, let's start from the start, I guess. Um, for the uninitiated among us, uh, who are you? What uh, what has been your sort of life's passion? And more importantly, I guess, how did you come to name your blog "Down Goes Brown"? Yeah. All right. So uh, let's. Uh, uh, I guess let's begin at the beginning. Uh, I have been a, a sports fan my entire life, and have spent a good chunk of that time. Uh, wanting to be a a sports writer from the moment that I realized that was a real job, uh, I uh, had always been sort of fascinated by that idea and, and thinking that you know wouldn't it be cool to just write about sports? And uh, as I as I got older and uh, finished high school and and went off to uh, to university, I ended up pursuing uh, a degree in journalism, uh, which was the the pathway to that sort of job back then. And uh, it, during the course of doing my four-year degree, I, I came to the realization that I really liked writing about sports. I didn't really love reporting about sports. I didn't love uh, going to every single game and asking the same questions and getting the same cliches. I definitely didn't like actual real reporting uh, where you call people up who don't want to talk to you uh, or where you spend a lot of the day sitting around waiting for people to call you back uh, so that you can ask them questions and um, by the time I was I was finished school, uh, I kind of figured, you know what, maybe this isn't for me after all. And I, I went down a different path career wise. Uh, but I always had that itch to write. Uh, that was the, the, the thing that I missed. And, and so I kind of became that guy who would like write the 
way too in-depth fantasy football preview for the for the office league uh or who would uh you know be involved in some thing or other where i'd end up writing some uh uh, some game story for for some video game uh, that, that like six people were gonna read, uh, just because I liked it. I I liked uh, I liked the writing side of it, and it was a hobby. And about geez, ten or twelve years ago, I guess now, when it uh, when it suddenly you had all these blogs popping up, and and anybody could write and actually have a little bit of an audience. Uh, you know, even back then it was it was hard to grow much of an audience, but you could get a bit of one. Sounds like and podcasting, but I digress. It, yeah, it's it's not. It wasn't all that different from uh, uh, way back then. So uh, you know, I thought oh, this is great. This is perfect. And I sat down and I decided I was going to start a blog about hockey. I'm I'm a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, so I, I figured I would write mostly about that. Uh, the the name Down Goes Brown comes from a uh, famous Joe Bowen call. He's the the uh, play by play guy for the Maple Leafs, and uh, there had been a fight between the Blackhawks and the Leafs. Sylvain Lefebvre of Toronto and Rob Brown of Chicago, and and Lefebvre knocked Rob Brown out at center ice, and Joe Bowen started yelling Down Goes Brown, Down Goes Brown, uh, which is a playoff, obviously on on the Down Goes Frazier call, uh, and for some reason it just stuck. Hit with one throwing right hands at Lefebvre. Another right hand by Brown. LeFay gets an uppercut. Down goes Brown! Down goes Brown! And LeFay leaves him there. TKO. Robbie Brown down like he was shot. Like, if you were a Leafs fan back then, there wasn't a lot of good stuff. Like, we certainly didn't have any Stanley Cups or, or anything like that to get excited about. So you took your excitement where you could get it. Uh, and it came from that. So I thought, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Back then, everybody was naming their blogs with people's names in it. It was like fire Joe Morgan and kissing Susie Colbert and stuff like that. So I was like, all right, you know, I'll do, I'll do down goes Brown. And I, I plugged that in and I started writing. And after a few months, I had a couple of dozen readers, maybe, maybe a bit more. Cause I, I, I tried to sort of piggyback off some of the more popular Leafs blogs but over time, very slowly but surely, it grew a bit of an audience, and and then a, a bit more than that. And I had a couple of posts that I wrote that uh, we didn't we didn't call it going viral back then, but that's what it was, where it, it suddenly you know just catches the wind in the right way and uh, uh, gets gets a bigger audience. And it just slowly over time grew to the point where eventually I had the opportunity to go and do it. Uh, on other platforms, which eventually led to being able to do it as a part-time job uh, for a website called Grantland, and uh, and then eventually to, it turned into a full-time job, and it has been ever since in in various places and and various versions. So uh, it and it's great. It's it's all sorts of fun. I I am doing the part that I love, which is the writing part, without doing too much of the actual uh, work of reporting. Uh, and uh, I plan to keep trying to do that for as long as uh, they will let me get away with it. Well, but it's not just it's not just a, a popular blog, right? You also have a, a a very unique spin on stuff, right? We, and there's a hefty dollops of humor, shall we say, and and quizzical uh, inquiries and uh, and other otherwise sort of uh, uh, you know uh, sharp jabs, perhaps where it's needed uh, in in a league that you know I think every league you know fan and and and, and structure right has its own sort of uh, unique uh, and questionable issues and stuff but uh, it's 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 not just simple analysis quote unquote right which probably makes it more interesting and and uh and fun to sort of keep track of versus just sort of you know which draft pick this and you know which uh you know which is the next market for expansion that that kind of stuff because lord knows that this league is uh i don't know defied logic on a number of different sort of uh all along its history yeah so when i first started the blog I wanted to do very straight ahead kind of analysis. This was back in 2008. The Maple Leafs were very bad. They had just fired their general manager. They were starting a rebuild, except they weren't really starting it because they, they couldn't trade any other players. And and I wrote, you know, very serious um, analysis and and virtually nobody read it. And every now and then I I would try something a little different and I would do, I would kind of try my hand at, at uh, humor writing, comedy writing, uh, because in addition to sports, my other love as a kid growing up was was comedy and stand up and that kind of thing. And when I tried that stuff, 
I could see the needle move a little bit on the audience, and I sort of thought, okay, you know, it wasn't it wasn't overwhelming by any sense, but I thought, all right, it, maybe this is the thing that I can I can be a little bit unique because the weird thing about hockey, and you, you sort of touched on this, is there's not a lot of there's not a lot of humor when it comes to hockey. Like I, I found that, like, and 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 that was as somebody who loved humor and loved hockey. If there had been other hockey humor writing out there, I probably would have just read that and and not bothered with it. Uh, with trying it myself, but there wasn't. And I don't know why that is because Canadians are well known around the world for both of these things. You know, Canadians are are known as the hockey uh, fans and the hockey players. But also when you look at like stand-up comedy and especially sketch comedy, there's Canadians all over the place. So you'd think the, that Venn diagram would overlap and we would have uh, lots of hockey humor up here, but there really isn't very much of it uh, and I think partly for the same reason, there's not a lot of religious comedy. It's because people view it as, you know, this is very serious stuff and we don't make jokes about this topic. Uh, and that always struck me as so weird when it comes to sports. No, of course you're going to have fun and make jokes about it. This is this is like this dumb, weird thing we've all agreed to pretend and treat like it's really important, but it's not. It's just for fun. Uh, and so I treated it that way. And, uh, you know, to this day, I, I still I, I don't get to do a lot of the pure comedy writing uh, that I that I used to do. But I still get to approach things, with, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, a little bit less serious than than maybe some others. And people expect that from me now, which means I can maybe get away with working it in more often than uh, I ordinarily could. Well, but I mean, you know, no. Even two weeks ago on your uh, your podcast, right, Puck Soup, uh, which will sort of get a little promotional too. Uh, you, it, it was d- devoted to basically the No Fun League, right? And uh, it just, it, I, I, it actually is interesting. I never really thought about it, but I guess I'm now I'm thinking back on our our various conversations in and around the NHL and and hockey generally. I guess, and again, this is only a layman's kind of three years into this sort of obsessive pursuit of stuff around all sports, not not just hockey. Uh, you know, I'm a fan, but I wouldn't say I'm, you know, a, a gigantically uh, deep and, and hugely knowledgeable Canadian born, you know, uh, rabid uh, uh, fanatic. But um, uh, it really does seem that a lot of the quote unquote fun that might that's emanated from pro hockey over the decades, really, I guess, in my mind, only comes from that of the WHA just because of its sheer comical uh, uh, value. But I, you know, I that said, I think you could probably take the craziness and the wackiness of the WHA and all its shenanigans. And, and you juxtapose that against the NHL and maybe arguably some of the reactions taken by the NHL and, and arguably comedy gold to be mined there too, if you really think about it. Yeah. And, and there is, and I mean, the WHA certainly uh, went in some different directions, but not all of that was by design. And, and, and that is the thing. Hockey's given us a lot of comedy over the years it's just almost always unintentional it's it's uh uh they don't set out to make us laugh but by the end we we kind of have no choice uh and and you know they these days the nhl does try to put that foot forward every now and then and and like most billion dollar corporations it it usually doesn't go uh especially well but uh, you know I'll, i'll give them credit they they do try from time to time and there certainly have been some personalities in the nhl that uh, had a had a sense of humor and let that show, but there's just something in the culture of hockey that is certainly for for a lot of the players or the people directly involved who are playing or coaching or in a front office. Uh, it, you know, you're you're not supposed to joke about this stuff because that's showing personality, and hockey doesn't like personalities. If you're if you go around cracking jokes and and having a big personality, that implies that you're somehow bigger or better than the team and that's that's the hockey's way is that nobody's bigger than the team and everybody just needs to kind of uh you're you're one of 20 guys and nobody gets to be special beyond that and it's you know that that's kind of admirable in a way but certainly if you're trying to market a sport uh it's it's not a great uh it's not a great lane to be stuck in and and for whatever reason in the hockey world and not just in the nhl but everywhere that's kind of become a thing that uh, they, they've really had to push back against. Because when you look at other, you look at the NBA and and to to a somewhat lesser extent, the NFL and Major League Baseball, they've got all these big personalities that that really steer into it and embrace it. And then you get to hockey and you got Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid who are brilliant on the ice and then just boring as butter toast once they get off there. 
uh, and and probably not because that's necessarily their real personality. They're probably very cool and fun guys to hang out with, but you put a camera in front of them and, and years of hockey conditioning takes over and they just say the most boring things they, they can possibly think to say. Well, that's um, that's interesting. It seems like it gives you ample room to be a uh, a or the court jester, if you will, of 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 hockey, because it seems like there's uh, just pl- ample room for uh, for taking shots and uh, uh, making uh, observations and musings. Well, let me get th- then to the rationale behind uh, the book, because it's it's kind of a semi scream if you really uh, uh, dig into it, because. Yeah, you know, while we love sort of going through sort of methodically the history and the teams and the league, uh, leagues generally, but the teams that uh, sort of come and go or relocate or are the sort of mi- uh, the escapades that sort of uh, are behind all of those stories. Why do you go to the extreme then, knowing how the blog needs to be fed, if you will, and now podcasting? You know, this is a, it's a beast that never sort of ends. There's always another uh, another day, another week to sort of fill in stuff with. Why add to your uh, to your troubles, a book, uh, and perhaps maybe a little bit of a sense of how you went uh, about sort of trying to frame a history through your own sort of uh, unique set of glasses. Yeah. So I, the, the first time I got to do a book was in uh, a, a couple years in after I'd been blogging again, built up a bit of an audience, and I got approached with this offer to do a book that would be mostly a best of with a little bit of new material. And, and that book came out in 2012, and it was fun. It was a fun process, and it was it, very cool to see it through start to finish and to have something at the end that I could hold in my hands and that my parents could put on the shelf at home and, and that kind of thing. Um, it, but having done it once, I sort of figured, OK, I, I won't do another one unless it can be something that I really want to do. And and, uh, and and it fits with with exactly the kind of approach that I want. And and so when I ended up talking to some publishers, one of the things I said to them is, look, I, I'm I'm a bit of a history nerd when it comes to the NHL. I've, I've always loved learning about the history of the game, the old players, the old teams, the, the the stories. I said, I would love to do a history book, but I don't want to just do a history book because there that's been done and it's been done really, really well. There are some really good history of the NHL books already out there. I said, what I would like to do is take that And put a bit of a twist on it where we tell the whole story. We start from the beginning. We do the full history. We do all the big stuff. But we do – we shine a bit of a light on some of the weird stories and some of the the, the silly stuff or funny stuff or uh, just head scratching because the NHL has so much of that. And, uh, you know, like the way that I I pitched it to them and and they ended up using a version of this on on the cover of the book was I want to do the story of – the world's most beautiful sport is prevent, presented by the world's dumbest league, that being the NHL, this league that just can't ever seem to get out of its own way. And everybody who has ever been a hockey fan, an NHL fan, has had those moments where you're sitting there watching this league try to do something. And you just kind of look at your fellow fan and go, does anybody there know what they're doing? Uh, and then you have the follow-up question, which is, has has this league always been like this? And the answer to that is, yeah, pretty much from day one. In fact, even from before day one, this league has always had weird stuff happening and uh, uh, just these these kind of strange stories. And a lot of them don't get told and repeated. A lot of them do get told and repeated, but they just sort of get mentioned in passing. It's It's the kind of story that your favorite columnist in the eighties would like drop in the last few paragraphs of, of one of his, his stories or that the play by play guy and the color guy, when they, when the game is seven to one in the third period and there's nothing happening on the ice to talk about, they just bring up these random stories. And, and that's always the stuff that I've been interested in and that, that got my attention uh, even growing up as a fan. I wanted to do something where I could talk about that stuff. uh, And, and both, you know, in, in, in a lot of cases, share it to a new generation who had never heard these stories before. But what's been even more satisfying, and I didn't really anticipate this, is the number of people who reached out after the book came out and said, the story that you told about, you know, in chapter 17, or the thing you said on page two, I had heard that when I was a kid, and I never heard about it again. And I always wondered if I imagined it. And I was so happy to actually see it written down and go like, yeah, this actually did happen. uh, Because I remembered being told about it or reading about it or something. And then that was just really cool. And, and so it was an opportunity to do the book that I wanted to do, 
Uh, I, the, the publisher was on board. They, they wanted to see it happen and we had a lot of fun with it. And people who have read the book, uh, seem to, seem to really enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's a light read. It's not a textbook. Um, I, I couldn't, uh, if I wanted to, uh, write that sort of book, uh, it's a chance to sort of have some fun with the, the weird history of this very, uh, often strange league. Well, let me circle around a couple of them, right? And and uh, I'm certainly happy to hear you augment and or supplement with with other ones that I might miss. But you know, I maybe sort of near the beginning, I guess, of the history of this league. You know, what what you sort of in two different chapters talk about the forgotten teams and then the dawn of the original six. And I guess the way I could frame that question is there's a mythology around the original six, right? That I think today's generation thinks were the, truly the original six franchises of this league for the longest time. But that wasn't the case. It was a lot more inchoate and uh, 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 ill-formed and full of, of, well, full, but certainly a number of franchises that uh, were rumbling around in the beginnings of this league uh, that uh, didn't even make that sort of original sort of six mythology. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're right. The league promotes the hell out of this original six concept. And if you're a fan of a team uh, – Outside of the original six, you're, you probably roll your eyes at it because, I mean, good Lord, every time Detroit plays the Rangers, we're all supposed to bow our heads in, you know, that this is a, this is the, the holy original six has, has come to visit us again. Uh, and, and a lot of fans are very surprised to find out that the original six uh, are not the original six teams in the NHL. And in fact, the NHL didn't start with six teams. Uh, the NHL, uh, the original six era begins in 1942. The NHL starts in 1917. There's a full quarter of a century uh, where it's not the original six. And in fact, the NHL starts with four teams. It goes down to three. It gets up to, I think, 10 at some point. I, I think there's only like one or two seasons where it actually has six teams. And it's not the original six because uh, the American teams all come a few years, uh, in fact, several years in some cases, after uh, the, the the league is established. The the only two teams from the original six that actually were original franchise in the NHL are the Montreal Canadiens and then the Toronto Maple Leafs. But they weren't even the Maple Leafs back then. They they didn't have a name and they went through a bunch of different names. So if if you went back to 1917, the only team that any fan today would recognize is the Montreal Canadiens. And yet we still have this view of the original six, even though there's this whole 25 year era where teams are coming and going and and, and teams are showing up in markets that turn out to be important in modern NHL history, like St. Louis and Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. But none of those were the first, you know, the Flyers and Penguins and Blues were not the first NHL teams in those markets. There were these other teams. Montreal Maroons or, or the New York Amherst or Americans. Yeah, were exactly. You had you, the New York, you know, the Rangers were not the first team in Madison Square Garden and the Canadians were not the first team to play in the Montreal Forum. And uh, you've got people, you have teams, their arenas are burning down and they're going out of business halfway through the season. You, you've got one team, you have the Ottawa Senators who are not the current Ottawa Senators, but they, they were uh, one of the better teams of that era. You've got a team in Hamilton uh, that is no good year after year and then finally has a season where they finish first and the players say, well, if we're going to play extra playoff games, we want more money. And so they go on strike and the league basically shuts them out and says we're going to have the playoffs without the first place team and then they end up moving to new york and that's the end of hamilton to this day as far as the nhl there's just all these crazy stories which you would expect i mean we're this is the 1920s it's a brand new league it's, these teams are all on the verge of going out of business at pretty much all times it's chaos there's uh you know the new york team is is being run by this guy who's who's an entrepreneur which is a nice way of saying that he was uh, like he was a bootlegger. He was a gangster. He was, you know, his, his money that he used for the team was coming from uh, selling moonshine out of, you know, illicit bars that weren't supposed to exist during prohibition. It's just it's just madness. And it's stuff that, you know, obviously today you would you could never imagine any of it. But back then, that's that's how these leagues ran. And, uh, you know, the NHL was no exception. And then it gets to 1942 and you settle in with these six teams. And at some point, the NHL just decided we're just going to pretend our history starts then in 1942. Uh, and it doesn't. There's this whole whole weird chapter that comes before that uh, a lot of today's fans don't know anything about. So why the whitewash then, says, asks a, a relatively naive, you know, uh, you know, hockey, you know, fan, but not fanatic. Like why? I mean, that's what it seems like. Right. I mean, and I get 1942, obviously, during the war, just like, say, the NFL, which was, 
you know, on death's door during that time, baseball severely contracted. I mean, you know, pro sports, and we're getting a taste of that now again in a modern sort of sense with the COVID stuff. But, 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 but I, I'm just curious as to maybe why the paintbrushes came out, you know, and kind of made this sort of uh, uh, quote unquote original six kind of the say we say artificial starting point for the real history, and why the abandonment, I guess, of what seems like a very, uh, 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 you know. Uh, uh, rascally and uh, 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 just a wild uh, uh, story-filled kind of a start uh, years before. I mean, I, I think a big part of it is that th- those in those early days of the NHL, the, the sport was still finding its legs, and a lot of it do- didn't really or doesn't really resemble what we know today. The, the rules were in flux. There, they, When the NHL first came in, there was uh, you know, the rules about the forward pass or about whether goalies were allowed to drop to the ice. It, it was it was still a sport that was finding itself. There was still a rover uh, used in hockey uh, quite often, and not in the NHL itself, but in other leagues and, and in the Olympics and that sort of thing. So I think to some extent, it's a little bit like saying, you know, why why don't we know more about Major League Baseball in the 1800s? And it's kind of like, well, because... Even though it was it it was there, it it didn't really resemble a lot the the sport that would we would come to know and love. And and then from there it just becomes a marketing thing because you 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 have all these franchises coming and going. 1942 comes, they go into the city. There's no grand opening. Nobody says, okay, these are the six teams, and we they are. It, it's just last year we had seven teams. This year we have six teams. The year after, who knows? But who knows turns into 25 years of the same six teams. And that's when, for most of us, um, you know, if you're my age, that's when your your parents probably were fans and your grandparents. And maybe these days it's your great grandparents. But, uh, the, you know, th- those are the stories that got passed down. And then the, the other teams pretty much got forgotten. And and I think at, at some point, you know, I, I don't remember the original six being that big a thing when I was a little kid, uh, because you know, back then it was it was only 10 or 15 years since uh since that era had ended. But I think just over time, the NHL did, to their credit, realize they had a bit of a marketing thing here and that there was a lot of good thoughts and, and memories buried in the, these fan bases. And so they would kind of bring them up and shine this light on this history uh, without having to answer a bunch of questions about how come all of these teams we're talking about don't seem to exist anymore. So that's that's it's ironic then because you're talking about a very um, ragtag and a, a seat of the pants kind of existence for shall we say the first 25 plus years or so, then the original six kind of gels, either by necessity or whatever, and then the irony is that truly it stays stable for another you know almost 30 years. Yeah, surprisingly. And- yeah, it's just a juxta- juxtapose that because my next real softball is. And again, this comes from a just a a generalist sports fan, head scratching, growing up as a kid, you know, seeing, you know, the New York Rangers in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. And then all of a sudden these there's this plethora of other teams, not only from just the NHL, but the why so long, number one, and why so explosive in 1967, this reluctance and then gigantic embrace of expansion. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess I guess the first thing we should say is I, I don't want to paint the wrong picture. It, when the original six era starts, there's not a lot of stability. In fact, it's it's, as you said, the middle of World War Two. So there there's um, it, there's it, probably the least stable time, uh, maybe until the present day in, in in pro sports history to the point where you know, some of the leagues were in, in serious danger of, of shutting their doors. Um, and, and I think you come out of that and there's sort of this feeling, okay, nobody's looking to have a sports team now. Nobody's looking to, to buy in because these leagues look like they're on shaky ground. Let's establish the teams that we have. And in the NHL's case, there's only six of them. They did actually look to expand in the fifties. In fact, this is, this is another thing I get into the, in the book that, that people who have heard of the, the sanctity of the holy original six are surprised to find that in the fifties, the NHL a- added a seventh team. They uh, they granted a team, and of all places, it was Cleveland was going to get the seventh team. The Cleveland Barons were going to move from the AHL and become the NHL seventh team, and it was it was done. They had set up the they they had uh, uh, created a schedule. They they had things all ready to go, but it was done 
on the condition that they had to come up with a certain amount of money at a certain time and and that ended up not happening and so the 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 the, the Cleveland Barons were put on hold and then uh, ultimately didn't end up happening uh, until many years later in the 70s a, a team by that name did, did it does briefly appear but yeah i mean there there was a seventh team and it was going to be the Cleveland Barons and and it was ready to go uh, right up until it wasn't and uh, it, the league did sort of poke around and think about other markets, but they seemed to be pretty happy with what they had. They were settled in. They had some stability, uh, certainly more than they were used to. And then the 1960s comes along. TV starts to be a thing uh, that you have to to think about if, if you're involved in a pro sports league. Uh, the NHL and its fans are looking around at these other leagues and realizing that, you know, the, the NBA – uh, you've got the the two football leagues that are about to merge. Uh, you know, no, nobody else, Major League Baseball certainly, no one else is running around with six teams. So there's there this sense of acceptance sets in during the 1960s that we have to do expansion, uh, and then the only question is how do we do it, how much, and where do we go? Uh, and that's where they make the as as you sort of highlight the the somewhat bizarre decision to say. Uh, let's go from six teams right to 12. Uh, we're going to do this in one year. We're going to double in size, uh, which was, it's pretty amazing when you think about it, because I mean, there's, there's six teams, there's 120 professional NHL hockey players in the world. You got to come up with 120 new NHL players over the course of one summer. It it was, uh, a bizarre and, and strange situation. And one of the, my, favorite things that I found when I was researching the book was a an editorial cartoon uh which showed uh it it ran in one of the Detroit papers uh which showed the NHL president uh as a expectant father in a maternity ward with six new babies uh laid out in front of him uh and he's looking at this little tiny jar of baby food that says talent on it and he says oh my god I'm gonna have to feed these six with an eyedropper and, uh, you know, the the joke being that there's not enough talent to go around. These new six teams are going to be terrible. And they were. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know to this day why the NHL didn't just say, like, let's go up by two teams at a time. But um, they they doubled overnight. And, yeah, the original six era is over. And uh, we're, we're into the beginning of the modern era. Okay, what's this? Ah, yes, the new book by Diane Shaw. I am happy and ecstatic to recommend it. It's called A Farewell to Arms, Legs, and Jockstraps. Who is Diane Shaw, you may ask, and what's it about? Well, Diane Shaw is a uh, a writer of mystery novels and biographies and other, other great works. But before that, uh, you may have known her in the 1960s and 1970s as the pioneering female sports journalist that kind of broke through the barriers, the glass ceilings, if you will. Uh, becoming really the first uh, major national newspaper sports columnist who happened to be female at the uh, Los Angeles Herald Examiner, for, uh, for that matter. And uh, it, her book uh, is just it's just chock full of great anecdotes. It's a memoir of all of her trials and travails, shall we say, uh, in trying to cover sports in this country as a woman. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, you young whippersnappers, you have no idea how challenging it was. And there's a whole generation and then some of female sports reporters and columnists and writers and and on-air personalities who can uh, owe their careers uh, to the doors that uh, she uh, just uh, plowed through uh, back uh, back in the day. And uh, some great stories and some great uh, anecdotes. And and one that we especially love uh, features a certain United States president uh, and uh, some interesting times when he was uh, running a team and then trying to bulldoze his way through uh, the old USFL, the New Jersey Generals in particular. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the story here. It's well worth <laughs> the price of admission in this book alone. And uh, we uh, highly encourage you uh, to check it out wherever fine books are found. It's called A Farewell to Arms, Legs and Jock Straps. It is published by the Indiana University Press and their imprint, Red Lightning Books. And we thank both of them uh, for uh, offering our listeners a- an exclusive free chapter download uh, right now. You just, all you have to do is visit this little uh, website and I'll repeat it again, cause it's a little clunky. Uh, and you're gonna get a free special uh, sneak peek 
free chapter of the book, A Farewell to Arms, Legs, and Jockstraps, just go to this website, iupress.org slash jockstraps dash good seats. That's iupress.org. It's I, the letter I, the letter U, press, iupress.org slash jockstraps, one word, dash good seats, one word. And again, you're going to get a free special sneak peek, a free chapter download of the brand new book by Diane Shaw, A Farewell to Arms, Legs, and Jockstraps. Uh, if you don't remember that uh, URL, we'll have a link to it on our website at goodseatstillavailable.com uh, off of this episode. And um, you will enjoy this book. I guarantee it. And I appreciate the friends, our friends, our new friends at Red Lightning Books and Indiana, Indiana University Press, hard to say, uh, for their sponsorship and uh, bringing our attention uh, to this great book by Dan- Diane Shaw. He says, a farewell to arms, legs, and jock straps. Uh, I know you'll enjoy the free sample, and I know you'll enjoy the book. Try it out, and uh, as they say, you'll be glad you did. All right, back to our uh, conversation. Here it comes. The, the word that keeps coming back in my, every time I go back into uh, history uh, stories around hockey and whatever the leagues are, it's... Um, and I don't know if it's the right word, but it's the one that pops in my head all the time. It's provincial, which, you know, is pejorative perhaps as well as uh, as a descriptive, right? But uh, – and I think that uh, that mindset almost – it feels like a right label perhaps for – I don't know. Some of this depression era, right, uh, born you know, or, or, you know, survived as, you know, and congealed as the six and kind of got through – the war years, if you will, as well. Uh, there's a mindset, I guess, when, you, when you're in the worst of times, right, you know how bad it's going to be or how bad it has gotten. And you don't, you always remember that. It's always a, a, an imprint on your, on your psyche or your, or your life going forward, right? It's always in the back of your mind that, you know, this kind of thing could happen again. We have seen the worst of times. I just wonder if there was a little bit of a, I don't know, maybe a hangover. I mean, the, the fact that only, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that the Cleveland situation, and I know they were a very popular minor league AHL franchise at the time, right, which seemed to be a good sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, harbinger for their potential to, to, to house and, and be successful as an NHL franchise. But I can't imagine that there was only one, you know, real kind of vetting process for one team in all those years leading up to 1967, I mean, like, w- did did the Cleveland experience scare them even further away? I just, uh, you know, as as they were labeling their divisions or, or you know, uh, their cups and all this by, you know, the various uh, lords of the game, right, which is wasn't even regional. It's not even geographical, right? It's, it's so provincial in its, its setup. It's almost sort of this little uh, uh, delicate, uh, uh, different kind of uh, league setting than the rest of pro sports as they were evolving. Yeah. And, and I mean, they, I don't think they exactly had a lineup out the door of uh, of real serious candidates. I, I think that was problem number one. Another big problem was, especially when it came sorry, to expanding. Because it was too regional, if you will, or too provincial or too sort of locked into the history of those handful of franchises that they didn't think it could export well, maybe? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't you know if it's a case of them being, you know, the, the NHL owners and, and, and board not thinking it could export so much as there wasn't anyone really lining up saying, I want to put a team here. And in fact, the problem that they ran into, especially when it came to the United States, which was the big market they wanted, they needed to be in, uh, certainly once, once television became a thing, there weren't, there were virtually no NHL caliber arenas anywhere in the United States that weren't already being used. Uh, there, there was when they sat down to do the expansion in the '60s. That was a major issue: is that they, they, there were very few markets that actually had arenas. That I mean, forget about NHL quality in the sense we think today. There, there were very few that had arenas that you could play NHL games in. Period. Even if the you know that had a, even a couple of thousand people in the stands, it just wasn't something that got built in communities back then. And and uh, the other piece of it, and and these two kind of end up tying together, is. The NHL to this day re- remains and has always been very much an old boys club. That is very much part of the history and culture of the league, which is you're either in the club or you're not. And if you're in the club, then you have your run of the place. And if you're if we let you into the club, then you can come in, but you're going to keep your mouth shut for the first decade or two until you earn the right to sit at the big table and, and have an opinion. 
um, and everyone else is kind of on the outside and, and we're going to look down on them. And, uh, it, you know, where that ties together is when they sit down to do the expansion in, in 1967, they, they're sort of sitting there going, okay, well, where are we going to go? Um, they want to go in California because they, they want, they want Los Angeles. That's a big market. That would be their only team out on the West coast. So they decide we, if we're going to go to California with one team, we need a second team. That's where the, the, uh, the golden seals come from the, the, where they go put a team in Oakland. Our very first episode with our pal, Mark Gretschmill. Uh, the, the, yes, that was, <laughs> we, uh, that was just, yeah. it, 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 it continues to be a head scratcher and we, and we love going deep on it. Yeah. I, and, and one of the most fascinating sports franchises in, in history, but you know, a lot of people go, why did they, why did they put two teams in, in California? It was literally so that when Toronto or Boston or New York didn't have to fly out to California to play one game, they could play two and maybe even bounce back and forth between the two teams and play three or four games and then come back home uh, and not have to do the trip over and over again. Um, but they, they've got that. They, they've got Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. They have some interest. They have some decent owners. Um, and then of uh, Minnesota is is an area that, that did have a hockey history. And then the other team that, that looked like it was going to be the sixth team was Baltimore. Baltimore has had a – for – for then and, and well into the 70s was kind of always the bridesmaid. But what happened is they decided they they really wanted to be in St. Louis. And by they, I mean the owner of the Blackhawks. Uh, this is this is when the Hawks and the Red Wings were both owned by brothers, the Norris brothers, which is why you, you, you had the division named the Norris and, and the trophy named the Norris. It's because there were these two brothers who owned the teams. And one of them said, we got to put a team in St. Louis uh, to be a rival with my Blackhawks. Well, guess what? It's because there was an arena in St. Louis and the Norris guy, he was the guy who owned it. And he was basically just looking out for himself. He needed a tenant for his arena. There was nobody who wanted a team in St. Nobody wanted to own it. Nobody was stepping up and saying, we want to go there. But the league put a team in St. Louis anyways and figured they would just find owners later. And, and that's sort of why Baltimore ended up not getting a team. Uh, it was just an NHL owner had this arena, figured he could make a little bit more money, and and he forced that through. And 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 those are the sorts of decisions that get made um, throughout NHL history. Anytime you see the league do something strange at a franchise level or an organization level, you can usually trace it back. And somebody who has a big chair at the big table of the old boys club uh, is just looking out for their own self interest. Well, so talk about the uh, the. Uh motley crew of of owners that came now to double in size right i I can't imagine that process given it being such a well-entrenched all boys club old boys club uh and now some of the shall we say shared economics if you will of of even some of the expansion things how i knowing the, the 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 seal story as as much as i do right you know the um who uh, who found who first? I, I have to think that uh, all the sort of nouveau riche, shall, shall we say, or the, the newbies, uh, were not necessarily warmly embraced by the uh, uh, the cozy club of, uh, of of history. No, and it, and it was a little bit difficult because what what they did in in certain markets, uh, particularly uh, at Pittsburgh being one of them, at Philadelphia too, I believe, is they we're finding people who are already involved in other sports. So people who are involved in the NFL, for example, um, and you know, these are professional football owners. They're not necessarily looking to come in and be told what to do. Uh, but you're right. It's still, you know, there, there is a reason that, uh, growing up in the eighties, I was looking at, uh, divisions called the Norris division and the Patrick and the, uh, uh, and the Adams and, and not divisions that were named after, um, you know, the guys who had uh, brought the, the Flyers to Philadelphia, it was uh, it, it was clear who was running the show. It was clear who had the power, um, but also they needed you to uh, make sure that the checks got in on time. So as long as that was happening, I think generally uh, they were OK with uh, uh, with having the new guys. But it was understood that when it came time to make the rules, uh, they would it would be the old guard that would do it. But that was probably okay for the new guys because the old guard didn't necessarily always know what they were doing. I mean, they the six new expansion teams come in and they put them all in the same division, which guarantees that one of those expansion teams is going to be in the Stanley Cup final. A ridiculous decision. You would never make that today. But back then, they I guess that made sense to them mainly because nobody wanted to be the one team that was going to move to the expansion division. And eventually Chicago had to do it years later. But 
everybody was just looking out for their own interest, which was not necessarily what was in best interest of the league and not necessarily what was in the worst interest of the the new guys coming in. And and why uh, maybe it's just, maybe uh, in hindsight it's twenty twenty, but why the pers- at least the what I could see is the perceived slight of not adding at least one of those six franchises in Canada. Yes, and that and that was controversial at the time because it was uh, at, at a certain point in the process it was assumed that Vancouver would get a team that that was really the only Canadian market at the time in the sixties that that felt like it was it was big enough and and even then people understood that. The league was chasing the American TV money largely by doing this, but it was assumed uh, for a period of time that Vancouver was was going to be uh, was going to be a team. And when that didn't happen, it was announced that they were going to be in bringing in six new teams that were all going to be American. There, there was a bit of an uproar in Canada, and it even became a political thing in the House of Commons. People were demanding answers and and all of this stuff. Um, but it it ends up being a, a short term problem because. It, Vancouver and Buffalo then arrive in in 1970. Uh, it, but even then, it, you know, you you get this situation where the league is at that point still divided into two divisions. It's the East Division and the West Division, and the East has the original six teams, and the West has the new six teams. Even though Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are further east than Chicago and Detroit, it, it doesn't matter. They're not worried about the geography. These two new teams come in. And they put Vancouver in the East Division, which if you know your Canadian geography, Vancouver is the furthest you could possibly get from being East. Um, but at that point, they want all the Canadian teams to be in the same division. So they just say, screw it. And and a whole generation of Canadian sports fans uh, fail their geography test for the next well, few years. But it matter, right? Because the, the, the divisions weren't even named geographically, They were right? They were still this sort of the Smythe and the... All no, the, but back back then it was East and West and all of that. And then, and then and then a few years later, I think somebody kind of went, this doesn't make any sense. And then throw throw some, some fancy names on them. But yeah, you had the... Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I joke about this in the book. The NHL has always failed geography. There was a time back in those early days before the original six where there was a division called the Amer- called the America American division and there was a Canadian division. And the Canadian division had an American team that was the New York Americans in the Canadian division while there was an American division. So it, it, at that point, once you've established that precedent for your attention to detail, I think Everything is uh, everything is on the board. So, I, I, from what you could tell, what was the was that that, that doubling of size uh, a success? Because I mean, it, it's hard to kind of juxtapose that with, I guess the the three rounds of expansion that happened every two years thereafter for three sets. Uh, because it just seems like they, I, I don't want to say they got it worse each time, but it just seems to be like some of the the, the moves. And obviously, the latter two of them being much more uh, exacerbated by the the sudden arrival of the of the World Hockey Association, it almost feels like okay, they got sort of a taste of this expansion thing, and I don't know if it was an addiction or it was like I, it doesn't feel like it. Still, it looks somewhat ham handed uh, when you look back at it. Now, I wasn't you know sort of paying attention or conscious at the time, but how, how can you describe sort of the the six teams that that followed in? At least it was done in a in a measured every two year manner. Yeah, yeah, it was. I mean, it, it was chaotic, and it's it's amazing when you think about it that in nineteen the nineteen sixty six sixty seven season there are six teams in the NHL. That means there are six, not six pro hockey teams, but six, for lack of a better term, big league hockey teams uh, in North America, and that's it. And and so there's one hundred and twenty jobs for uh, professional hockey players. If you want to play in the the top elite league and make decent money, uh, you've got to be in the NHL. There's 120 jobs in the entire continent. Um, it doubles in 1967. They had two new teams in, in 1970, two more in 72, two more in 74. Uh, and then meanwhile, the WHA comes along and you get to the point where by the, the mid seventies, I mean, we're talking 10 years after the original six era, there's so, like something like 25 professional hockey teams. The thinning out of the talent was so radical and remarkable that, uh, you, you know, certainly when there were only six teams, yeah, that probably wasn't enough. In fact, it, it almost certainly wasn't enough. Even though Canada was was really supplying all the players back then, there were very few American players. 
Um, there, there were lots of really good players who just couldn't get a break, couldn't break into the, into the NHL. Um, but to go from six to something in the twenties between the NHL and the WHA was, was just crazy. And that is a big part of why you suddenly see these scoring numbers explode in the seventies and into the 1980s. I know, look, I, I mean, I, I love Bobby Orr. I love Wayne Gretzky. I love Mario Lemieux. Uh, but we like to look back and kind of romanticize and, and just go like Bobby Orr was so good. He set these records. Phil Esposito, oh my goodness, what a what a, a, a an amazing player that he could shatter all these records. A lot of those records and that offensive explosion comes when suddenly instead of the best 120 player in, players in the world, it's the best 500 players in the world that are involved in this league. Uh, there are a lot of really bad players in those 70s and, and 80s, and and you you sit down and watch the watch the highlights and everything the the goaltending is awful the defense is awful half the guys don't even seem like they can skate backwards and it kind of leads to this era where suddenly you got guys getting 200 points and you're going wow is did everybody just get really good uh you know what not necessarily it's it was some guys were really really good and a lot of guys in the league suddenly were were really not very good at all but we've had Dennis Murphy on this uh, this show, and uh, and he sort of describes uh, the WHA's early days as uh, more about sort of getting investors to buy franchises more than worrying about sort of the quality of, of hockey. And and uh, the other sort of sidebar, of course, is the uh, restraint on on trade and the restrictions and and the, the ability for players to kind of not be indentured servants. And, and it's a it's a playbook that uh, repeated itself and in various other leagues that, that he pursued too. But I, I guess it's, I wonder though, right? Uh, it's not like the United States was just clamoring for more professional hockey per se. I mean, I know it was certainly increasing in popularity, but it doesn't seem like there was just like out, outcry for more more professional hockey. It just seemed like it just, it went from, to your point, too little to by 1974, far too much yeah it's it's a classic overcorrection and and i think what you saw was you know you you asked earlier if, if the 1967 expansion could was successful and i think in a certain sense you would have to say that it was they brought in six teams uh, four of those teams the the flyers penguins uh kings and the blues are are still around to this day and and are reasonably successful the minnesota north stars Ended up having to move in the 90s, but that wasn't because Minnesota wasn't a good market. In fact, they have an NHL team back now. Really, the Golden Seals were the only one of the six that didn't work. And you know what? Five out of six is is, pre- is a pretty good success rate. So I, I think the fact that you know you had those teams come in, then Vancouver and Buffalo come in, those are also two real good markets. Suddenly people go, you know what? There's more markets out there than we think, and 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 the business model is starting to evolve. And you're maybe starting to think, you know what? You don't have to be the size of New York or Toronto to have a team. Maybe we can make this work. And other markets now, you know, I I talked about how in the '60s nobody was really knocking at the door. Okay, now now you're starting to get knocks on the door. Now the phone's starting to ring. Now places are starting to call up and you know and say, hey, I'm down here in Texas or I'm you know here I, I want to put another team in Toronto. I, I'm we're in Quebec. We're in Connecticut. We're in uh out out west in Canada. In between Vancouver and Toronto, there's got to be uh, some room for some teams. And so um some of those markets, yeah, ended up being able to support professional hockey. Uh, a lot of them very much didn't, but it sort of became instead of the 1960s NHL approach of we got to be really, really, really sure that this is going to work before we go in. It became if we think it might work, let's let it, let's give it a shot, and then if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And and certainly the WHA and the NHL at this point in the 70s start seeing franchises moving around. You, you have um, the the Seals go to Cleveland, and then Cleveland basically folds, becoming. To this day, the last professional sports team to to just fold, not move or or go, so, but to to just disappear, um, it, and it becomes this very weird and frantic era that that is is very strange to us to look back on. But I can only imagine what it must have been like to be a fan who had lived through decades of the original six, and then suddenly the NHL is is tripling in size, and there's teams moving and coming and going, and there's this other league. It it really must have felt like madness. Yeah, I, I, and I. It's also too. It's interesting too because it also becomes now the NHL becomes content right for arena owners that are looking to fill dates right. So 
the business model, I guess, of pro sports really goes from, you know, really kind of uh, renting and finding places to play to more, you know, more vertical integration, like say Jerry Buss, for example, right, who ultimately winds up getting the forum, right, but 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 buys into a couple of franchises, World Team Tennis, and then uh, the Kings, and then the Lakers, and then sort of the crown jewel then becomes owning the arena itself, and then it becomes an exercise in making sure not only uh, the dates get filled, but then obviously to try to create championship uh, uh, goodness amongst uh, as many of those as possible. And it, it, I guess the the dynamics just only work in the NHL's favor. But it it doesn't – it's not without a few fits and starts, right? I mean, the, the Atlanta Flames, right? You, you think on paper, you know, a, a, a market that at least was growing, right? Hockey in the South, questionable certainly at that time. And again, Atlanta with the Thrashers later, you know, a generation later – Still not sticking. The Southern and the Western expansion, right? I mean, these are franchises today that are, you know, uh, with the ex- with the exception of Las Vegas, which is a unique situation and are arguably a bit of an anomaly. You know, there's still some real shakiness and question around whether Florida should be an NHL market, whether Tampa Bay is one when they're not winning cha- a championship or two. Uh, I wouldn't call it haphazard, but it just it seems when you juxtapose it against and maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're you're the humorist slash <laughs> analyst. Uh, I don't know the, the the way that the NHL has sort of gotten to now. I'm knocking on the door of 32 franchises. Uh, seems uh, maybe it's more measured now, but it doesn't seem like it was measured even going through the 90s. Yeah, it's it, that's that's true, and and it's it, it's kind of been a history of like we said overcorrections. I, I think there were probably a lot of people including many people in the NHL in, in, at high levels who were not convinced that the 67 expansion was going to work and, and may have expected it to be a massive failure. And when that didn't happen, okay, now we veer all the way to the other side and we say, let's get as many teams as we can. Let's, let's go crazy. Um, keep in mind that also a, another element of this is that you've got this competitive league, so the NHL and WHA are not just competing for players and fans, they're competing for markets. And there may be times where you think, we got to get in there first, because otherwise the other guys are going to beat us there. Uh, and so that the 70s is crazy. It ends with the WHA uh, essentially failing. It, it had been clear for a few years where that was headed. They end up having a, a merger with the NHL that isn't really a merger, but the, the NHL brings in four of the WHA teams, the rest of them go away. So, so we're now up to 21 teams in the NHL, but but no more WHA to compete with. And then the NHL stays at 21 teams for basically uh, the next decade. All, all through the 80s, there's a couple of teams that move, but there's no expansion. And then you get into the early 90s, and by this point, the TV market is starting to change. The economy is starting to change again. You're you're starting to see different ways to to monetize on pro sports. And here comes another round of expansion. And so they add another team in California, the, the San Jose Sharks, which which given that Wayne Gretzky has just been in California, he's just been traded there. It's a success in L.A. It makes sense to add the, another California team. And you say, OK, then they do another expansion. And this one, everybody thinks it's going to be Milwaukee. Everybody thinks it's going to be Hamilton. Uh, and the NHL shocks everybody by announcing after this year long process uh, that they're going to Ottawa and Tampa Bay. And, and everybody scratches their head and goes, that doesn't make any sense. Neither one of those places even has an arena. We don't know how the finances are going to work. Well, it turns out they were the only two bids that actually had the money to match what the NHL wanted. And so that's as far as they went. And you've got the, 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 the senators are playing in this junior arena where half the arena doesn't even have seats. The, um, the, the Sharks are playing in the Cow Palace. The Lightning are playing in a baseball park. Uh, because there's just there, there's no rinks in Tampa anywhere, and they 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 just got to take what they can get. And okay, at this point, the league is up to 24 teams, and everyone goes, okay, that'll do it for a little while. Uh, and then uh, just one day in in uh, 90, uh, 92, they just announce, oh, we're adding two more teams out of nowhere. It's almost impossible to imagine today. I mean, the, you look at what we saw in the NHL. As far as the whole process to go to Vegas, as far as the whole process to go to Seattle, just took forever. I mean, years after we knew they were going to those markets, there's still this whole process and it takes years. The NHL just one day called a press conference and were like, we're expanding to Miami and Anaheim. And there had been no 
process. There have been no bids. There have been no speculation. It was just this jaw-dropping thing. And, of course, it turned out what had happened is Disney had shown up and said, we want a team uh, to tie into the Mighty Duck movies. And this is going well, and Michael Eisner has decided he's a hockey fan. Uh, and when Disney comes calling, you say, yep, we can do that. The NHL announces in December that they're going to do this uh, expansion, and the teams are going to start playing the next year. Like, it's there, it's less than a calendar year from – No one had even heard we were thinking about expanding to these teams being on the ice. Uh, Completely bizarre. Uh, That gets them to 26 teams. They take a bit of a break through the 90s. Um, Gary Bettman shows up and and starts laying the groundwork to add more American teams. Uh, And then we add four more around the turn of the century, turn of the millennium. And that, that gets us into 2000, 2001. And then there's there's nothing until just recently with Vegas. So we, again, the, this fits and starts of, you know, let's add three or four or six teams or maybe even more, and then let's just take a decade or two off. Or let's add a bunch of teams. These days we seem to be back in the add a bunch of teams uh, phase of the cycle, although uh, they're doing it certainly much more slowly than they did when it came to uh, the Panthers and the Mighty Ducks. Well, it's interesting to me too, and I will sort of like rant round the corner on this. I, I, it, um, it's just interesting to me because the, the NHL of the quote unquote Big Four, or if you want to squint and maybe put MLS in there as maybe a Big Five, it's probably the league that is most dependent on uh, in venue attendance and and all the revenue streams that come from that relative to television and national. Obviously, very popular nationally in Canada or arguably maybe even less so because of so many more US teams but that's a it's another sort of digression but then you look then you look at the markets that they're in right the NHL and it's it's not frankly the strongest television footprint relative to the other leagues right so i i wonder which came first right is it sort of they've doomed themselves to tv contractually in that they are playing in a smaller market in north carolina they are playing in a bunch of smaller markets, if you will, relative to the big ones in the United States, in Canada, you know, like in Ottawa, for example, no disrespect, uh, or Columbus, right, which is, you know, uh, you know, aside from the Columbus crew, the only pro team in that market, right? Or is it that that it's just not a nationally attractive sport to begin with, and it doesn't matter where these teams are actually domiciled? I, I just, I, it, it's head scratching to me as to why they're so, I guess, behind on that television revenue component that the other leagues seem to enjoy yeah and you, you can certainly see it in the in the 90s where they start to chase those uh those tv markets not only in, in terms of expansion but as far as um as far as teams moving and 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 that's important i mean the nhl has never had an especially good u.s tv deal there there were times where they had no u.s tv deal at all as far as national uh, um over the air uh, um broadcasts and that affects your ability to grow the fan base, and it affects your bottom line, especially, uh, you know, more more recently in history where the, those dollar values get very very big. And we've seen, you know, the NFL could could never sell a ticket and still do uh, do pretty close to break even just based on its TV deal. Uh, the NBA is not quite there, but but way up. Uh, the NHL isn't, and it, like you said, the NHL is still very dependent on. Uh, the day-to-day game revenue. It's it's ticket sales, it's concessions, parking, the merchandise you sell, all, all of that stuff. And it, and it becomes a challenge because it becomes a chicken or an egg thing. Because on the one hand, you say, uh, you know, we, we there's there's no point putting a team in a big market area if the building's going to be half empty because that team's not going to be able to stay in business. But the flip side is, well, you know, if we only go to the markets where we're already popular, how are we ever going to expand? And how are we ever going to get a big TV deal, which will then have us be seen by a bigger audience? And and how are we ever going to grow? And you can kind of see the fits and starts. And it's something the NHL has struggled with. I mean, you you look at uh, certainly compared to, you know, when I was growing up, the, the idea of the NHL in Florida would have been bizarre. The idea of the NHL in Texas would have been bizarre. The the idea of the NHL going back to markets like Colorado uh, or or Atlanta, where it had already failed, would have been bizarre. Now it turns out the Atlanta one we would have been right on. But um, you can kind of see them chasing some of these markets and and you know the Carolina and and that. Uh, and yet, do you see the results? It's it's tough to say. They they the current TV deal is the best they've ever had, but it's not especially good. 
uh, there's a lot of speculation the next one will be much better. I'm sure it will. Uh, I, I can't think of anything I'd rather be selling these days than uh, live sports uh, on television. Uh, it's it's a gold mine at this point, and the NHL will hopefully cash in. But yeah, it's it's something they've always struggled with is do we stick with where we're wanted and where we're popular and consign ourselves to being a niche sport pretty much forever and yet probably a it, a successful one, at least in the sense that all our teams will stay in business, or do we expand, you know, look a little bigger, think a little bigger and, and try to go to some places where it may not work. But if it does, um, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be a rising tide that lifts all the boats. And, you know, Gary Bettman has sort of pushed them more towards that second option with some very notable failures, obviously going back to Atlanta did not work. Obviously Arizona has been a decades long fiasco uh, the, the 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 panthers have really uh had a very tough time of it but also some successes and, and you know you look at most recently vegas and nobody thought las vegas was going to work for the nhl they, they thought the nhl was crazy for trying it it's been an enormous success so you, you got to give them credit for that as well well they've been propping up phoenix for so you know i yeah so all right so let me let me ask you a twin question to sort of to uh to sort of round out our, our conversation this has been uh, a great and sort of a, a, a fun sort of a overview of stuff, right? So 32nd franchise in Seattle, not this season, but next season, uh, even before the COVID crisis sort of uh, came upon us and arguably is still, you know, as uh, probably a, a bunch of uh, uh, stories and uh, and situations still yet to play out for, for an undetermined amount of time. Is 32 teams, is that enough? Is that too much? I mean, I look at, say, Major League Soccer at 30 teams. I mean, I I would I was making the argument prior to COVID that uh, we might have been starting to enter a perhaps an era of peak pro sports in terms of how many franchises, the quality of play. There's only so much you know real estate and television revenues and all that, and then now we're sort of entering into a, a sort of a new and uh, definitely going to be very different. Yeah, I don't disagree that the, that live sports is going to be valuable because there's been a dearth of it. For the last couple of months, but at the end of the day, there's still going to be now, if you will, 31 going on 32 franchises in this league, and at least in the United States, almost you know a third to a quarter of the uh, folks uh, largely unemployed, right? So I, discretionary income and uh, cable subscriptions and all the is Seattle going to be it? Do you think there's still room for more expansion? Do you think there's relocation maybe, which solves? Some of the ills of current franchises. What what do you think the state of the current NHL is right now in terms of numbers of franchises and their relative health? Yeah, I mean, it, even even prior to this pandemic, the NHL had said that they were done for at least a little while. Now, history has shown we can't necessarily take their word on that. They said they were done uh, in after Ottawa and Tampa, and and a few months later they added more teams, but. Um, they they had indicated at least that 32 for now was uh, was a good number, um, and at some point you do run out of markets. Now there's there's it. I'll tell Quebec or Hartford yeah, or Kansas it, City that right. There, there's always got to be a couple because that's to your benefit, right? Because here's the deal: it's it's a bit of a shell game, and you always have to have a couple of markets in North America that want the NHL and seem like they could support the NHL and don't have it because that's how you blackmail all your local markets for the new arena or whatever concessions and tax breaks your owners want. We need Quebec. Quebec probably won't get a team, but we need to have Quebec so that when it's time to shake down Calgary or Ottawa or whoever else, we need to have somebody to threaten to to move the team to. We need to have Houston or Portland or whoever it is uh, that we can threaten Arizona with so that we can make sure we get exactly what we want. That's like, that's the game of pro sports. Gary Bettman's very good at playing it. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's that many more North American markets. There are international markets and the NHL could be someday uniquely positioned to go to Europe, for example, have a European division. And we, we know that the NFL is, has been looking at that. We know that the, the NBA to some extent has, um, the NHL actually, if they ever wanted to put six teams in Europe, could probably figure out a way to do it. Um, obviously, there'd be some some pretty big challenges logistically, uh, in, uh, among other things. But they may be better positioned to do that than than certain other sports would be. Uh, but at the end of the day, everything that was on the table, everything that was in the plans, that's all collapsed now. Nobody know has any idea 
what the future holds. And nobody has any idea what the next few weeks holds for the NHL, let alone uh, years. I, I, I don't think we will see expansion anytime soon. If this hadn't happened, if we hadn't seen this pandemic, could it have gone there? Maybe. Maybe you get a couple. If only because, I mean, they, they got a ton of money for Vegas. When they came out saying they wanted half a billion dollars, everybody laughed. They got it. And then Seattle came along and they said, let's go $600 million, and And Seattle paid up on that. So uh, if I was an NHL owner, I'd probably be in Gary Bettman's ear every time I saw him saying, is there a 33rd team? Is there a 34th? Like, I would love to get the, a few more uh, tens of millions in my pocket just to uh, to let someone else come and and be in the club. Um, maybe they would have gone that way. I can't see it now. And and you just really hope that we don't lose teams. I don't think we will. Uh, you know, this is not the 1980s where teams are are on shaky footing and and could potentially have to close their doors um, unless it gets to an extreme situation. And, and maybe we do. It's it's going to be very, very ugly for a lot of these teams. Um, but at this point, I, I'm cautiously optimistic we won't lose anyone. But yeah, it's probably going to be a while before we add again, just because it, who, who's got that amount of money suddenly that they're they're looking to spend on on a league that where suddenly the, the future looks shakier than it, it had uh, in, in probably decades leading up to this. All right. Our thanks to Sean McIndoe. And uh, let's see, we've got lots to promote for Sean. Uh, and let's get to it, shall we? On Twitter, you will find Sean at Down Goes Brown, at Down Goes Brown. Uh, the name of the blog is Down Goes Brown, which you'll find at, naturally enough, downgoesbrown.com. Just put that in your RSS feeder or bookmark it or do whatever you want to sort of keep on t- top of that. Uh, the book in paperback form, uh, it is published by, who is it published by? It is published by Vintage Canada, and uh, it's called The Down Goes Brown History of the NHL. It's a hoot. Uh, if you've uh, ever read sort of the more encyclopedic uh, histories of the NHL, that's great, but you need to read this one uh, in parallel with it or perhaps uh, afterwards to to kind of uh, understand some of the uh, crazy ins and outs that uh, aren't sort of dryly sort of uh, thrown out there on your uh, your local Wikipedia page. Um, let's see. Uh, Sean also has a book out from a couple of years back called The Best of Down Goes Brown, the greatest hits and brand new classics to be from Hockey's Most Hilarious blog. Uh, that's also out there and available. And all those uh, uh, things will be found off the uh, link of the uh, description of this show, number 167, for God's sakes. Uh, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, you'll find convenient links. Uh, to those books and to his blog and all that kind of stuff, as well as, by the way, conveniently, all 166 other, if you're listening to this in real time or or others yet to come, episodes uh, from all over uh, pro sports as we've gone into all the various things of uh, defunct and uh, forgotten and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and a lot of hockey stuff, a lot of WHA stuff with our pal Ed Willis, uh, Mark Gretschmill on the California Seals. Uh, Adam Rader about the Minnesota North Stars. We talked about the original six with Andrew Ross. You know, uh, our, our great conversation with the late and great Tim Gasson, the founder of the World Hockey Association Hall of Fame. That's a, a wonderful episode and a great tribute. Uh, the Brooklyn slash New York Americans with our pal Dale Morrissey. Uh, we got into the Golden Seals also with Steve Courier, the Whaler guys, uh, Troy Treasure, Kansas City Scouts. I mean, lots of World Hockey Association and NHL forgotten uh, history uh, there for you to be found and plenty more to come. Our, our interview with Dan Bouchard, I can't forget that, uh, the Atlanta, the Atlanta Flames, uh, J.P. Della Camera, our interview uh, when he talks about his uh, his couple of years of, uh, of calling Atlanta Thrashers games. It's all there for you and all those other great sports and stuff. Again, at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Follow us on social media. Uh, we're not huge fans of Facebook these days. I don't know how much longer we're going to stay there, but uh, there is a, a page devoted to us there. But uh, we're a little bit more active, I think, in uh, Instagram land. We'll find us. Uh, you will find us there at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, we're probably the most active, I guess, on Twitter. Uh, and you'll find us there at Good Seats Still. You want to send us some email? Go ahead. It's hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And by all means, uh, when you're at our website, uh, sign up for our email a newsletter that we send out each and every week, which gives you a little bit of a tip off to what our show is going to be for the uh, upcoming week. Usually we send that out during the weekend. 
uh, a day or so in advance, and you'll be sort of the first to kind of know on your block as to uh, what the latest uh, latest doings uh, is going to be for the coming week. We thank you tremendously for uh, giving us a listen. Uh, we thank, of course, our pal Jerry Payne down in Metro Atlanta uh, for all his goodness editorially and uh, production-wise. And uh, again, our thanks to you. Please indeed stay safe, stay sane, and uh, hang in there. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week with another hopefully fun-filled episode. Until then, take care and uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Hello out there, we're on the air, it's hockey night tonight. Tension grows, the whistle blows, and the puck goes down the ice. The goalie jumps and the players bump and the fans all go insane. Someone roars, Bobby scores at the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Second period, where players dash with skates of flash, the home team trails behind, but they grab the puck and go bursting up and they're down across the line. They storm the crease like bumblebees, they travel like a burning flame. We see them slide the puck inside, it's a 1-1 hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Third period, last game in the playoffs, too. Oh, take me where the hockey players face off down the rink. And the Stanley Cup is all filled up for the champs who win the drink. Now the final flick of a hockey stick and a one gigantic scream. The puck is in, the home team wins the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game. Oh, the good old hockey game is the best game you can name. And the best game you can name is the good old hockey game.